the same section that I was just reading from in the Brookings Institute thing. You don't need to show my screen here, Zach. Some podcasters also cited non-peer-reviewed preprints and data, which often contained faulty statistical analysis or poor research designs, to bolster their prior beliefs on the efficacy of ivermectin, for instance, while summarily dismissing similar non-peer-reviewed studies whose conclusions ran contrary to their preferences. Uh, I read that, and then by chance, um, because uh, I get nature and science into my inbox whenever they put out a new issue uh, I, I saw this which you can show my screen now this from nature this week this is nature news so you know nature is one of the two uh, most prominent science journals in the world and they also have a basically a news section so it's you know it's a great source for uh, science news covid drug drives viral mutations and now some want to, want to halt its use analysis reveals the signature of the antiviral drug molnupiravir in SARS-CoV-2 sequences riddled with mutations so there's a lot to talk about there and i don't know that we're going to talk about most of it right now but i just want to point out that nature um, which is not a right wing political podcast riddled with misinformation. Is that what we are? Yeah, n nature's not. I think we can all agree. Um, this is um, this study was post what? This study was posted on the Med RXIV preprint server in January. It has not yet been peer reviewed. But why is Nature talking about oh it then? Oh my goodness. They There's have... probably statistical errors in there that the peers would certainly have discovered because the peers definitely know the difference between. Uh, Right. Causation and correlation. Which, of course, um, pretends that the effect of peer review is to vastly increase the quality of what is published, and that is yeah. actually a testable hypothesis. I'm trying to remember, somebody wrote a very good, I believe it was a substack, evaluating peer review's effectiveness at this very thing. I read it a couple weeks ago. I will attempt to dig it up, and assuming I can find it, we will put it in the, in the notes of this podcast. But the point is, peer review is actually a failure in this regard. And we acknowledged at the point that we talked about many things on the preprint servers, that that does increase the amount of noise. However, what it means is that you don't have all of the skullduggery that takes place in the so-called peer review process interfering with your ability to know what's going on. You basically have uh, a raw scientific discussion and you have to sort wheat from chaff, which is what we do. And that's yeah. part of what we did from the beginning. Now, we, and we've talked about peer review many, many times on this podcast, including very early on in our discussion of COVID back in like March or April of 2020. Uh, you know, it the idea sounds brilliant. It's not inherent to the scientific process at all. Um, what is is uh, opening up your ideas to be challenged by friend and foe alike. That that is um, an important part of the scientific process. But peer review is not. Peer review is basically a modern invention to deal with the fact that we, you know, there's a lot of people trying to do science now and trying to get the attention of you know even a larger number of people. Um, <clears throat> but uh, peer review itself it actually acts more like a gated community now than like an actual ability to, to sort wheat from chaff. You know, I mentioned earlier that I used to do peer review. Uh, and uh, very often when I would say, you know, rec sort of the, the things that you can recommend are like, this is awesome, no change is necessary. Uh, this is really good, but there's a couple things, you know, I'd like to know more about what this analysis was, you know, they need to look into the literature over here, this, that, and the other, um, you know, or recommend to uh, to reject. Those are, you know, usually more categories than that, but this is sort of the three categories that as a peer reviewer you're, you're offered uh, to recommend for a paper. And uh, very rarely when I said recommend to reject on account of there's no hypothesis, that they're pretending there was, uh, was the paper actually rejected? Mm. Uh, because you know peer review is often done as sort of like a majority vote. It's like okay, well, the editor is going to send this out to three possible peer reviewers, and they're going to come back. And if I'm the only one who gives a damn about there not being a hypothesis, uh, then the paper is not going to be rejected, and it's going to you know go into the literature. Yeah, it's so, a very it's a very arbitrary filter. Yeah. Uh, that often introduces errors. It sends authors back to do things that are unnecessary. It <laughs> Fails. And you know, and the, the the differences between the peer the peer reviewers is you know, it's it's funny. Like this, it's yeah. its own it's, it's severe, its own literature. It's a severely right? broken process <laughs> yes. that has really no purpose. Right? It's yeah. really a holdover from a time in which there was a limit to the amount of stuff that you could publish because ink and paper were expensive, and so that space had a value. Yeah. 
Um, and the fact is, this stuff is now electronically published. Why should anyone be in a position to stop you from publishing a piece of work because it's bad? If it's bad, it doesn't stand up. But if it's great and somebody said it was bad because they were your competitor and they didn't want it to see the light of day, why should that have any weight at all? You well, so, you know, if I'm if I'm in a steel man, you know, why journals, why editors, right? There's too much information uh, and we all have to we all have to figure out some ways to funnel our attention to ex you know to exclude some of the things that want our attention so that we can focus on this and i've told this story before too but you know we we are generalists we have done very you know very focused highly specialized work in a number of domains um but we are more or less generalists as in general is uh the approach to understanding life that is evolutionary biology but I remember the you know two day interview that I had when I was uh, applying for the job at Evergreen. Uh, I had an hour free between all the different interviews and such, and I went to the library, and the library was pretty bad. It was, it was very bad. Uh, it was a little, you know a podunk library without very many journals at all, and this would have been in two thousand two, I guess. Uh, and so there wasn't as much available online. And I went to uh, one of the faculty on the committee that was deciding whether or not to hire me and said, how do you how do you do your work here? I don't like I don't I don't see how you can do your work when this is the library you have access to. And this person who I respect greatly said, oh, I subscribe to the three journals I need. And that's it. That's all I need. I thought, well, but I don't just. I don't even know which three journals I would choose. I mean, I, you know, I, pr I could probably name three. If you really tell me you can only look at three scientific journals ever for the rest of your life, I'd pick three. But they certainly wouldn't be like, you know, in this particular little field. It doesn't let you do generalist work. It doesn't let you do generalist work. And, you know, especially given that nature and science, like all the journals are now so much crappier than they used to be and not honoring, you know, good science at all. Uh, you know, the idea that, oh, you, I just, I look at the thing that I need to look at, that I'm interested in now, like, even if that is good for you now, because the particular research program you're doing now for the next six months or a year really does take you into that space, how about letting your mind expand and go into an adjacent space and an adjacent space and over here and over here and over here? And, you know, that is one of the things that the Internet has allowed, that you don't need access to the Library of Alexandria or whatever its modern uh, counterpoint is. You can say, oh, oh, OK. And, and this, you know, this is actually some of the work that I did for Bob Trivers back when I was his research assistant as an undergrad before, you know, the early 90s. You know, he'd be he'd read a paper and be like, oh, wow, what? Oh, I want to see these references. Go get them. And Bob, I, you know, who was a generalist. Bob, who's a generalist, still is. Right. Um, and he'd say, you know, this is this is my job for him. Like I would run back and forth between his office and the library and get the references and photocopy them and bring them back. And he'd quickly say, I'm like, oh, this reference and go back. And now you can do that without having to hire a research assistant. Right. So uh, and it was amazing. And. If you really are only saying, oh, I'm only interested in these little things here, well, you're not going to be able to see the bigger picture, and therefore you are inherently going to be missing at least some of what is true and maybe all of it. A couple points. One, the reason, though there has been a, a dramatic narrowing of focus, graduate school narrows you to focus on a question so small that you can't get scooped because you're the only expert or there's one or two others and you know what they're working on, right? Yeah. And it's a terrible process from the point of view of getting the most bang for the buck out of science. You want people as generalists. A, they make much better teachers, right? If you want to teach the next generation how to think and what's true, you don't want somebody who trained very narrowly. You want somebody who trained broadly. But B, the innovations of a generalist are likely to be much more consequential, right? Yeah. The point is they're not some narrowly focused thing, which yes, maybe, you know, there's some cure for cancer lurking in your narrow little uh, realm, but probably not, right? If yeah. you're going to find some general principle that is actually going to level up a bunch of different disciplines, it's going to be a generalist who finds it. The second thing is... Um, you, you bristled a little bit at my claim that who's, why should peers be able to stop you from publishing your thing just because they say it's bad? The fact is maybe- I just said I, I can defend why editors and journals exist. Oh, 
I'm not arguing that editors and journal shouldn't exist. Maybe they should. I think by and large, they're terrible. But they're not the only thing that should exist. But the point is, that should be no bar to your yes. putting your work yes. somewhere where it can be evaluated. If it takes 500 years for your work to turn out to have been prescient, right? Yeah. The fact that people were wrong for 499 years after you did it right. is not an argument against people reading it. That's In right. fact, they should be able to go back and find out, you know, this person was dismissed at the time. Turns out they were right. And mm -hmm. so... The, the whole idea that we are being taken to task or reading the unpeer reviewed literature as if peer review was any good at all, which it isn't mm -hmm. right. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a negative influence for many, many reasons. Yep. But the idea that we are being taken to task, nature is not being taken to task because it obviously uses the uh, unpeer reviewed literature. And the whole point here is to put a shackle on our ankles, not to, to actually apply some standard generally mm -hmm. but um but the fact is look that literature is what it is and yes you need to realize that nobody has vetted it for you but the vetting doesn't work so okay there's a lot of there's a lot of chaff in order to get to the wheat you got to be better at it but that is the point point. and who's going to be good at it generalists